Journey into space. The BBC presents Jet Morgan in The World in Peril. crew travelling to Mars in the space fleet of three ships are now after coasting out from the Earth's orbit for more than six months within a few thousand miles of the red planet. Just before preparing to go into free orbit round the planet, Lemmy picks up a strange voice on the radio. The same voice that the crew of the Discovery had heard three weeks before, only then reception was so bad that it had been impossible for them to make any sense of what was being said. But now they understand every word. It is the voice of Frank Rogers, a member of the original Mars fleet who had been captured by the Martians and, so Jet believed, conditioned by them. Can I talk to him, Jet? Sure, if you think you can get any sense out of him. Hello, Frank. Hello? Who's that? This is Doc. Doc? Oh, Doc, what are you doing down there? You should be out here in the fleet with us on our way to Mars. I am. I'm in the flagship. I must talk to Earth for lunar control. If you have any message for them, Lemmy will pass it on for you. Lemmy? 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 What's the matter? Doesn't he like the name? Lemmy Bart. He got lost out in the land truck. I think this is Frank Rogers' jet. Every time we mention something to do with the fleet, it seems to jog his mind. But I was never lost in any land truck. Him and two others, they'll never get back to Earth. None of them will. I'm the sole remaining member of the whole fleet. Hello. Hello, Frank. Can you hear me? Oh, for goodness sake, Doc, let's take the message. Maybe that'll give us some insight as to what's on his mind. Ready to receive your message. Over. Hello, here is the message. I... 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 Receiving you. Give us your message, please. From Frager number one to Discovery, have routine checks. Are you ready to receive them? Whoever it is, he must be clean off his rocker. Hello, give us your message, do you hear? I can't. It's Whittaker. He's... Oh, my... Keep away from me! Whittaker? But he's dead. Get away, do you hear? Hello! Emergency! Hello! 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 What's all this talk about Whittaker? It sounded as though he was there with him. Hello, Frank, can you hear me? Hello? Oh, he doesn't answer, Jeff. Well, where is he? Where'd he call in from? From down there on the planet, of course. Where else? Oh, I know that, Lemmy, but from whereabouts on the planet? Now you're asking. Hello, Captain Morgan calling Frank Rogers. Come in, please. Look, Jet, we can't spend too long on this. The time for getting into free orbit is getting very close. Lemmy, take over, will you? Yes, mate. Keep trying to contact him. If you do, give me a yell. Meanwhile, the rest of us will get the ship ready. Hello, flagship calling Frank Rogers. I've not heard from you for some minutes. Come in, please. <laughs> Lemmy called Rogers for an hour, but we heard nothing more from him. At the end of that time, Lemmy had to leave the radio panel and return to his bunk, in readiness for the increase in speed that would carry the Discovery and the two freighters into free orbit a thousand miles or more above the planet's surface. The maneuver went off without hitch. When it had been completed, the main transmitter was retuned and Earth Control informed of the fact. We encircled the planet approximately every five hours. At the same time, of course, the planet itself was turning on its axis, so each time we completed a full circle, it was to find a new part of Mars below us. In this way, during a period of 18 to 20 hours, we were able to observe every part of the planet's surface. You may remember that when we had so hurriedly left Mars more than a year ago, we'd left three of our freighters behind. This was unavoidable, for with the loss of so many of our personnel, we had no crews to man them. The freighters were left encircling the planet in free orbit, as we were doing now. Provided they had not been disturbed, they should have remained in free orbit for many years, and naturally we expected to see them. But we were disappointed. What could have happened to them? Maybe they crashed down on the surface. Ah, but they couldn't. Unless somebody came up here and took him down. Well, it's time we began to survey the surface anyway. Doc, mm. get on the televiewer, will you? Yes, Jeff. Uh, use the telescopic lens. Sure. If you see anything of particular interest, photograph it. Right. Mitch and I will take turns with the telescope. And what do I do? Get back to the radio, Lemmy. Have another try at raising Frank Rogers. Yes, mate. 
We had been encircling the planet for three days, and our main interest now was centered on the oases, the places where the canals cross, and in particular, the great oasis known as the Lacus Solis, where we knew a Martian city was located. Can you see it yet? Yes, Mitch, I can. But it blends so well with the surrounding features, I'm sure we'd never have noticed it had we not known it was there. Any sign of any activity? Uh, not that I can see, but we can hardly expect to at this distance. Well, that establishes two cities up to now, the one in Ophir and the Lacus Solis. But there must be many more. Well, I'm sure there are, Doc. If we knew exactly where to look for them, we could probably see them. But to scrutinize the whole planet would take days, weeks, in fact, and we haven't the time for that. Then how about those uh, asteroids? We should see them. They're bound to be parked near together wherever they are and should be easy to pick out. But they can't come from the planet, Mitch. They're much too big. They'd never get off the ground, not in a thousand years. Where do they come from? And then? how do they get those spheres into them? What are the insides of those asteroids like? I don't know, Doc. But where they come from puzzles me even more. Well, how about one of you taking over here? I've stared through this eyepiece for so long, my eye is weeping. I'll take it, Jet. Very well, Mitch. I don't think there's much more to be seen in Lacus Solis, so cover as much as you can of the area up to the South Pole. We should be directly over it in about half an hour. Sure. Hey, Jet. What is it, Mitch? Polar base. It's still there. I can see what can only be the land trucks, both caravans. What? Here, let me take a look. Sure, go ahead. Well? Yes, you're right. But how did the second caravan get there? There should only be one. I? Well, don't you remember? I left my caravan in the Argia Desert. You, Doc, and Lemmy picked me up in that sphere, and we completed the journey to Polar Base in that. Yeah, yeah, I do remember now, though I can hardly say I was aware of it at the time. And how did that other caravan get up there? Oh, somebody must have taken it. Of course, but who and why? Oh, beats me, Jet, but there they are. You can see them for yourself. They're very minute, but there's no mistaking them, is there? No, there isn't. Hello, Landfleet. Polar Base calling Landfleet. Hey, Jet, I've got him. Is that it again? Coming, Lemmy. Stay on the telescope, Mitch, will you? Yeah, sure. You sure it's the same voice, Lemmy? Of course it is. But now he says it's Polar Base and he's calling the land fleet. Hello? Hello, flagship calling. Receiving you loud and clear. Over. Switch on the recorder, Lemmy. It's on already. Hello, land fleet. Polar Base calling. Have a message for you. Over. Take a bearing on him. We're so close to him now, we ought to be able to find out his exact position. Yes, mate. Hello, Polar Base. What is your message? We have routine checks for you. Are you ready to receive them? Routine checks? What's he talking about? Go ahead, Polar Base. Freight are now landed safely. What are your well, um, uh, will you repeat your message, please? Polar base to land fleet, repeat. Freighter now landed safely. What are your orders? Do we unload the land trucks now, or do we wait for number two to get down? First is number one, then is polar base. Now he's waiting for number two. Hello. Uh, hello. Who do you say you are? Polar base, Frank Rogers calling. I'm ready to start unloading as soon as you give the word. Polar base, did you say? Of course. Who else would it be? That's what I'd like to know. Have you got a bearing on him yet, Lemmy? Keep him talking just a little longer. Hello, Polar Base. Flagship calling. Flagship? But you can't be. The flagship is parked outside. Not a hundred yards from here. Aye? Hello, I'm afraid we're not hearing you very clearly now. Would you repeat your call, please? Hello, Landry. Polar Base calling. Repeat. Polar Base calling. Are you receiving me now? Over. Hello, Polar Base. Receiving you. We'll call you again in a few moments. Standing by. Doc? Mitch? Yeah. Come over here. See what you can make of this. Sure. Be right with you. Well, if he is Frank Rogers and he says he's at Polar Base, why shouldn't he be? That might be the answer to both sets of land trucks being down there on the ice cap. You mean he somehow got away from whoever conditioned him, found the caravan and took it back to Polar Base? Mm, what else are we to think, Mitch? All the trucks carry radios. He could be using one of them to call us. Yes, but how could he possibly know we'd be anywhere near Mars? Well, from what he says in his so-called messages, I doubt very much if he knows where anybody is, even himself. Well, I'm pretty sure there must be somebody down in those land trucks. Either Frank Rogers or somebody pretending to be Frank Rogers. You think so? Well, why not? Then maybe you can explain why the bearing puts the transmitter which sent those calls slap in the middle of the Mario Stralis. <laughs> trucks at Polar Base or down there in the Mare Australis? Just a minute. Freighter number two. And what about it? That crashed in the Mare Australis. It's probably still there. You remember Frank salvaged most of the supplies from it and took them back up to Polar Base. Well? Well, the last time he was in there, he got the radio to work, didn't he? Maybe it's still working. 
Maybe it's from number two's transmitter that those calls have been coming. It could be. But then why does Frank, if it is Frank, say he's at Polar Base? If you ask me, Jep, he don't know whether he's on his head or his heels. Well, in my opinion, that's to be expected. Whoever is calling us, and I believe it is Frank Rogers, he's certainly not in control of himself. His mind is wandering. Occasionally he does have periods of knowing exactly where he is. At other times, he lives in the past. Imagines he's still with the space fleet, coasting towards the red planet for the first time. And what's more, each time he doesn't just remember what happened over a year ago, he relives it. Hence, in his thinking, he is sometimes in freighter number one, which was his old ship, and sometimes at Polar Base, where he spent a great deal of his time after we'd landed on the planet. And uh, where do you think he really is, Doc? I'd say down in the Mare Australis, in the freighter number two. Yeah, but how long could he expect to remain there? He has to live. Well, there are supplies enough left in that ship to keep one man alive for three months at least. Yeah, and how long has he been in there already? I don't know. When did we first hear him calling? A month ago, but he could have been calling long before that. Well, I still think he's where he says he is, at Polar Base. You don't think the DF gear is working properly, then? Well, that's not that, Lemmy, but I think the whole thing's a hoax. A decoy to get us to land near the wrecked freighter, and once we touch down, we'll probably find a whole army of condition types waiting to greet us. The Mari is as flat as a pancake. If anybody is waiting there for us, we'd be bound to see them. So? So, if we do, we increase speed, rise again, and land somewhere else. I still think Polar Base would be a better bet. Well, I'd think so too if it weren't for that second caravan being there. Uh, the trucks may be a trap too, you mean? Well, why not? The Martians may well think we'd land in the same place as before, and that we'd need the land trucks to travel over the planet. Well, they've got another thing coming then, haven't they? We don't need them at all. Besides, they've got no proof we're even arriving. You think not? With spies obviously planted in Space HQ down on Earth? Well, maybe they have and maybe they haven't. But the fact remains, we have to land somewhere. We've encircled this planet a dozen times already. Well, I'm still for landing on the ice cap. How about you, Doc? The Mare Jet, as near to the wreck of number two as we can safely get. I think Frank is in there. If he is, we owe it to him to pick him up. And that's not all. If he has escaped, he'd be very useful to us. Tell us a lot of things we want to know. Yeah, always supposing he's in a fit enough state to tell us anything. He certainly doesn't sound like it at the moment. Well, who knows? He may come back to normal. We may even be able to bring him back. Yeah, always assuming we can find him. Hmm. Well, Jet, what's it to be? The Mare Australis. Okay, you're the captain. A uh, coder message, will you, Doc? Tell Control what we're about to do. Sure thing. Meanwhile, Lemmy will stay at the radio, send the message to Earth as soon as it's ready, and keep a listening watch on that voice. Right. Mitch, you and I will begin transferring from number two the fuel necessary to make the landing. Right you are. Put on your suit. We'll make the descent just as soon as our orbital position is favorable. <laughs> As soon as the message had been coded, I handed it to Lemmy for transmission, then went down in the hold to receive the fuel that Jet and Mitch were to pump into our tanks from the second freighter. We needed very little to get us down to the Martian surface, just enough, in fact, to propel us into the atmosphere through which, with the aid of our huge wings, we would glide the rest of the way. But to get off Mars again, we would, of course, need a considerable amount of fuel, so we had no choice but to take it with us. The transfer took about two hours. By the end of that time, Jet and Mitch were once again safely back in the Discovery. That's a weird feeling floating around out there with the sunlit side of the planet lying directly below. I felt at any moment I go falling down towards the surface. And that's just what we will be doing soon, Mitch. Uh, gliding down at any rate. I think we'd better prepare for the descent. Motors will be fired in half an hour. Right. How about it, Lemmy? Have you contacted Rogers? No, Jet. I've been calling him constantly all the time you've been away, but he doesn't reply. Well, if he is in that wrecked freighter down there, we'll be talking to him face to face before long. Uh, did Control acknowledge the signal? Yes, Jet, and they wished us luck. <laughs> they might well. We need plenty of it. Well, you'd better get on your bunks. Yes, Jet. Good. Then I'll get up into the pilot's cabin and get ready to take the ship down. Twenty. Twenty point five. Stand by to cut gyro. Right. Twenty one. Twenty one point five. Twenty two degrees. Gyro cut. All set, Mitch? Yeah, Jet. How long, Doc? Twenty five seconds. You can say your last farewell to the freighters. For the time being, at any rate. Well, let's hope they're still here when we get back. Fifteen seconds. Put her down in the right place, Jet. 
I'd hate to land in the Lark of Solas right in the enemy's camp. Oh, do me a favour, Mitch, and we got enough trouble. Ten seconds. Hello, land fleet. Polar base calling land fleet. Aye, aye. He's here again. Five seconds. Don't answer it yet, Lemmy. I'll tell you when. You don't think I'd get out of this seat now, do you? We're off. Hello, land fleet. Polar base calling. Can you hear me? Come in, please. We can hear you, but you'll have to wait now. Tell me we've got other things to do. Where are we now, Doc? Over the southern ice cap, Lemmy. Can you see the traps down there? Sure, come over here and look for yourself. Height, Mitch? 17,000. They don't seem to have suffered any damage, do they? No, and they certainly haven't been in action lately, or we'd be bound to see the tracks they'd left. That ice down there doesn't have a mark on it. And the ice cap's a lot bigger since we were here last. Yep. Winter has clamped down over the southern hemisphere, Lemmy. Five thousand feet. Where are we now, Doc? Over the Mare Australis. Get back to your seat, Lemmy. We'll be landing soon. Hello, land fleet. Polar base calling. Can you hear me? Have not heard from you for some hours. Land fleet yet. He's much louder now than he's ever been. He must be in that freighter. And the closer we approach it, the louder his signals get. Answer him, Lemmy. Tell him we've heard him and we'll call him in a few minutes. Right. Height, Mitch. Four thousand. Can you see the freighter yet, Jet? No, Doc, I can't. Well, you should. We're dead on course. Hello, Polar Base. Land fleet calling. Receiving you loud and clear. Over. There's no sign of it. Maybe the wreck has been cleared away. Hello, Land fleet. Receiving you at full strength. 3,000. Well, we're getting mighty close to something, Jet. Signals from Rogers are belting in. Hello, Polar Base. Receiving you full strength and all. What are your orders? Orders are that you have to be a little patient. We'll be calling you again in a few minutes. Is that clear? 2,500. I said, is that clear? Now he's not replying again. Hello, Polar Base. Hello. Never mind it now, Lemmy. Get back to your seat and strap yourself in. We'll be landing any moment. Yes, Doc. 2,200. Hello, Mitch. Doc. Yeah, Jet. I can see it. The wreck. Exactly as we left it. Standing off at his nose. I don't think anyone's been anywhere nearer. 2,000. Are we going to land anywhere nearer, Jet? I think so. Putting the nose down now. 1,500. And the flaps. Stand by to release a parachute brake, Doc, if I give the word. Okay. We're nearly down to landing speed. I think we'll make it all right. 1,200. Let's hope the ground is firm enough to take the weight. Should be, Lemmy. It's probably frozen solid anyway. Turn off the televiewer, will you? Yeah, sure, Doc. Televiewer, off. 1,000. No signs of any Martians yet, I hope? No, Lemmy. Nothing but the wreck and the purple plane as far as the eye can see. You'd never guess there was any kind of life on Mars from this view. 800. Put out a brake, Doc, will you? Number one, shoot. Release. 700. Coming into touchdown. Hold on to your hat. 600. Here we go. 500. Taking it a bit steep, isn't he? 400. He'll straighten up in time, don't worry. 300. Let's hope so. We've come a long way and no insurance. 200. 100. Get ready. Straightening out. Touching down. Now. Ooh, ooh. Tails down. We made it. Yeah, wait till we stopped and I'll agree with you. Now applying brakes. That's it, gentlemen. We're down. Good on you, Jet. First class landing. And we're all in one piece. But for how long, I wouldn't like to say. Can you see, Doc? Nothing. It's just as Jet said. There's only the purple plane stretching clear to the horizon. And the freighter? Oh, I can see that too, of course. It's to the west, about half a mile away. Well, do you mind if I get up there and have a look? Okay, Lemmy. But you could have used the televiewer and seen just as much. Oh, no, Doc. But that isn't the same as seeing it in the flesh. Lemmy. Yes, Jet? We've work to do. You can look at the scenery later. Oh, just my luck. All I wanted was a glimpse outside through the astro hatch. You'll get plenty of chance for that later. What's happening, Jet? We unloading the gear? Only part of it. Just the high-speed land truck. We're three hours before the sun goes down. Time to go over to that wreck and see if Frank Rogers is in it. Well, he must be. The last call we had from him definitely came from that freighter. It couldn't have come from anywhere else. The strength it was. Well, let's hope so. Well, who's going, Jet? Uh, Mitch and I. Uh -huh. While we're gone, Doc, look out for spheres or anything that might suggest somebody is heading this way to investigate us. Right. And you, Lemmy, will remain at the radio. 
try to re-establish contact with Rogers, and at the same time keep in contact with us over the personal radios. And what if Rogers isn't over there? He must be Mitch. Where else could he be? I hate to think, but I hope you're right, Doc, and that we're not walking straight into a trap. I'd bet my life there's not a Martian or conditioned Earthman with a hundred miles of here. If there was, we'd have been sure to see some sign of them when we landed. Or their spheres, at least. How, how else could they get here? Well, if you're so confident, let's go. I'll put my suit on and open up the cargo hatch. Hello, Doc. Can you hear me? Hello. Hearing you loud and clear. Mitch and I are in the truck now and about to head for the wreck. Right. Okay, Mitch. Start her up. Well, she seems to be working all right. Well, let's go. We haven't all that much time if we're going to get back here before dark. Hello, Jet. Yes, Doc? We're in contact with Rogers again. The signals are so powerful, they're overloading the receiver. Can you get any sense out of him? Uh, not really. Did you tell him we'd landed? No, but I did say somebody was on his way over to the ship. And what did he say to that? That he wasn't in a ship. Oh? Now he thinks he's out in space again. Lemmy's having quite a time with him. Well, get him to sit tight. Tell him we'll be with him in just a few moments. Okay. I only hope I can get him to understand what I'm talking about. All right, Mitch. This is close enough. Put on your helmet and we'll go outside. Sure. Hello, Doc. Yeah, Jet. We're alongside the ship and leaving the truck now. Okay. Testing personal radio. Okay, Mitch. And me, Doc. Okay. Then open up the airlock, Mitch. Airlock. Contact. Hello, Doc. Mitch and I are now outside and approaching freighter. Have you heard any more from Rogers? No, nothing. Very well. We'll inspect the ship first. We'll go around to the cargo flaps, Mitch. See if they're open. Yep. Well, they're open all right. The ship looks no different from how we left it over a year ago. I shouldn't think anybody's been anywhere near it. Even the ladder's down. Then let's get in. I'll lead the way. Take it easy, Jet. Don't worry, Doc. We will. Try putting the lights on, Mitch. Yeah. There. Well, the power circuits still seem to be working. Then let's go up as far as the cabin. Can you still hear us, Doc? Yeah, Jet. We're walking through the cargo hold towards the cabin airlock. Nothing here seems to have been disturbed. In that case, you should find the airlock open, the outer door anyway. Yeah, we've just reached it now. Well? It's closed. Oh. Then somebody must be in there. Call up Rogers. Tell him we're outside. There's no point, Jet. He doesn't answer anymore. In that case, there's nothing for it but for us to go in. Always assuming the remote controls are still functioning. They are. Come on, Mitch, and close the door behind you. We're in the airlock now, Doc. If Rogers is in the cabin, he should hear us operating it. Well, if he does, he gives no indication of the fact. Lemmy's calling him constantly, but gets no reply. Filling airlock. Opening cabin hatch. That's strange. The, the place is in darkness. What? Ah, oh, that's better. Mitch has switched on the lights. Take it easy, Jet. Have a good look round before you go in. That's just what we are doing. Well, is he there? No, Doc. The cabin is empty. Discovery calling. Put Doc on, will you, Lemmy? Yeah, Jet. Hang on a minute. Doc. Coming, Lemmy. Uh, take over the teleview, will you? Keep it rotating all the time. Yes, Doc. Hello, Jet. Doc speaking. What's up? Well, Mitch and I have searched the cabin over here thoroughly. And? And although there's certainly nobody in it now, there has been. Oh? How do you know? Well, the radio transmitter, it's on. And judging from the juice it's used up, it's been on about a month or more. Then we could well have been receiving calls from it. We must have done. Uh, and there's no sign of Rogers? No. Nope. Mitch is back in the cargo hold having another look, but it's pretty certain he's not in the ship. Well, maybe he, if it was him, left the ship when we landed. But how? And what in? We'd have been bound to see him. 
Hello, flagship. Frank Rogers calling flagship. Good grief. Did you hear that? Ah, oh, say I did, and no wonder. It was this transmitter that radiated that call. What? Yes, Doc. It's working by remote control. Oh, where from? That's what I'd like to know. Answer the call, Doc. See if you can get any sense out of him. Uh, then switch off your transmitter. I'll contact him direct from here. Transmitter off. Hello, land fleet. Flagship calling. Receiving you loud and clear. Go ahead. Hello, flagship. Thank goodness I've got hold of you at last. Where are you? Well, what is more the point, where are you? At Polar Base. My instructions were to stay here until further orders. Did you find the wreck? Yes, we found it. How about the crew? Are they hurt? There's no crew in her, Frank. No? Then what's happened to them? Where have they gone? Listen, Frank. Yes, Doc? You're up at Polar Base, you say? Of course. Are you alone? Yes. That's the funny thing. Where is everybody? Yesterday, the discovery was parked right alongside these trucks. Now she's gone. Where are you? Listen carefully, Frank. Are the land trucks still mobile? Of course they are. Why shouldn't they be? Then these are your orders. You will drive your truck down to the Mare Australis. What position? We'll put out a bearing beam for you. That should guide you straight to us. Very well, but... But what's happened? How did you get down there? Why wasn't I informed? Never mind about that now. Just come here as quickly as you can and call me as soon as you're underway. Message received and understood. Call you again in half an hour. Hello, Jet. Did you hear that? I certainly did, Doc. It sounded exactly like Rogers that time. Uh, but he still seemed very confused. Do you think he really is at Polar Base? Where else could he be? He's been calling from there and using the transmitter of number two to boost his signals, just as we did last time we were there. Well, if that is the case, and if he manages to handle the truck, he should be here in about 36 hours. Yeah. I don't think there's much point in Mitch and I staying over here any longer. We're coming back. Good. Just as well. It's getting dark soon. I'll give you a call as soon as we leave. Good. Meanwhile, I'll set the DF system so Frank can home on us. Hello, Doc. Yeah, Jet. Now leaving cabin and about to enter airlock. We'll call you again just as soon as we get outside. Right. Uh, any further word from Frank? Oh, yeah. He reported that he's using the bearing signal and is already on his way. But he still seemed very puzzled about our being down here. Okay. Call you in a few minutes. Doc! Doc! What is it, Lemmy? Come over here, quick! Yo, what is it? Those perishing spheres. Hundreds of them, like a flock of birds, and all heading this way. Look at them. Land six, they are, too. Do you think they're coming after us? What else would they be doing? Oh, blimey. The game's up, then. We don't stand a chance against that lot. And what about Jet and Mitch? They'll be out in the open in a few minutes. You keep at the televiewer. I'll call them up and tell them to stay where they are. Hello, Discovery calling. Jet. Hello, hello. They're getting very close now, Doc. Almost directly overhead. Hello, Jet. Hello. What's the matter? Can't you get them? No, Lemmy. They don't answer. That was episode seven of Journey Into Space. Taking part in this recording were Andrew Folds as Jet Morgan, Alfie Bass as Lemmy, Guy Kingsley Pointer as Doc, and Don Sharp as Mitch. Other parts were played by David Jacobs. The orchestra was conducted by Van Phillips, who also composed the music. Journey into Space was written and produced for the BBC by Charles Chilton.